Hey, today is Monday, October 2nd. I'm back with Imran. We're doing our Monday morning meeting again. How are you doing? I'm good. Another week. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. The, the feedback, uh, surprisingly, people like the Monday morning meeting. So we're going <laughs> to mm -hmm. give the people what they want. So here we go. Looking at the S&P, this was the big thing we were talking about yesterday that we thought that the, you know, there would be some weakness. There's a bunch of uh, dynamics that we discussed. Kind of go check out that video to look at those dynamics. Um, but the, the two big things, one, we got the pull down into those 4,200s into Friday and the VIX popped up like it was threatening to really bust out, but we never really got that kind of full expression of ball, right? Uh, what do you think about that dynamic as it, as it rests now as we head into this week, the first week of October? So, yeah, so my, my theory was the last week that there was that big short strike at 4,210, 4,250. Right, the JB Morgan right. position. Yeah, and, and that was creating some short gamma exposure right, between the start, but well, that was going to die on Friday. So so there was fragility in that if the market had a reason to go down, like yields breaking even higher, or whatever it was, and the market started to sell off, that could create a little bit of panic, panicky price action. Okay, right. That didn't mean that we were going to get pinned down at that strike. It was just going to create a bit right. of panicky price action. It's and very and fluid. Some sort of vol spike with it, right? And we did get that ball spike. We, we, we got to 19 and a half ish on the VIX. But then, then the idea was that everyone, every dealer kind of knows that this big JP Morgan trade is coming on Friday, where that gamma is going to expire and they're going to sell a fresh big clip of Vega to the street. And we're talking about $10 million of Vega type side, right? So that, knowing that that's coming, if I am a dealer and I used to be a dealer, I used to deal with these sort of flows and these sort of trades all the time, right? If I'm a dealer, and I know someone's going to sell $10 million of value to the street on Friday, and it's a systematic trade, and it's telegraphed, and it's definitely happening, whatever happens, I'm going to use any vol spike to get myself a bit short vol, because I'm going to have the inventory to then buy the vol back on the bid side when the seller comes, mm -hmm. right? So because of that psychology, and because of the idea that you've got this massive flow that is well telegraphed at the end of the week, my idea was that if vol did spike midweek, it would get sold into right and it wouldn't it wouldn't last long right because people in their right mind on the dealer community would say okay let's slash smash some bond out here and we know we're going to get given it back on friday so there's good risk reward in doing that basically. so so that was the logic and that seemed to be what happened in the vix last week yeah and i also said that this week now just started i think we might still retest those lows that we made last week but if we retest those lows last week and we don't see vol spike in the same way, that tells us the street is less short now, that the street is more comfortable with the Vega that it's sitting on, and actually more medium term, that gives us the springboard to rally off, basically. Right? So that, that's, my now, that's my new revised scenario that we did play out as we thought, and now any weakness into this week, provided fixed strike vol doesn't rally, provided the VIX doesn't make a new high from what it got to last week, should be a signal to say, okay, time to gear up for the move higher into year end. Yeah, I, I, I like a lot of that logic. I also would add that the JP Morgan position gets just so much attention at this point. And, and there's, there's a lot of validity to it, a lot of, a lot of the mechanics you just mentioned. There's a whole lot of other interest at that 4,200 strike. We calculate around $100 billion of total put deltas across S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell. So there was not only that position that was in play, there's, there was a bunch of other puts kind of in that same vicinity. Some of those could be related to the, to, to the trade as well, just you know, people, people trying to play it and whatever it may be. And so some of that has come off. And, and I agree with you that we're in this area and we're looking for a springboard rally. I would argue a little bit earlier. I would just say that, and this is part of the Monday morning meeting, if we could break that I-430 area, that is my signal that we're set up to rally in that maybe we pull forward kind of the Vanna that's built up and we're in this negative game environment. So we could run pretty, pretty sharply. I still think the 4,400 area is, is kind of the easy upside target in that scenario. And to your point, uh, you know, we could very well remain kind of stuck in the mud here and things could remain a little bit chippy, but if we break that 430 spy area, which is roughly uh, 4320 in the S and P, then I think that those dynamics will kick in and we could get a pretty short, uh, sharp, short covering rally. Um, and that's the setup that I am favoring. Um, I, I do think personally that this 4,200 area is going to be a possibly a downside 
uh, limit um, uh, into October OPEX. So, so we'll see those play out. Um, I want to pivot quickly to you made uh, you brought up two names that were quite interesting. UNH last week, uh, just kind of check the tape. UNH did close down about a percent, I believe, uh, from your call there. Um, and so that stock is kind of working in the right direction. You had recommended that at least some short, short term puts. And the second one, uh, which I thought was very interesting for this week was Google. Despite all the weakness last week, Google was up. You made a longer term call uh, on Google. I like that call. It did close up up on the week while the rest of the market was down. They got a lot of AI stuff cooking. And uh, as one of the big seven, if the market does rally, I do think that this could uh, have some asymmetric upside to it. Uh, as is part of the big seven and, and, and the stocks that seem to gather a lot of the strike. Um, let's uh, pivot now to the calls for this upcoming week. This is your single stock strategy compass. Do you want to walk us through the two tickers that you brought up here and yeah, uh, yeah. the setup that you see for this week, again, Monday, October 2nd? So firstly, I will say that none, none of the names on the compass were like really far away mm. from the center, right? So yeah. generally when they're not super far away, then the conviction levels aren't going to be right. quite, okay? Um, but it's the Monday morning but, meeting, so you got to give us something. I've got to say something, exactly. Yeah, you've got to give the people <laughs> what they want, right? Uh, now, I think JP Morgan stock um, yeah, has been consolidating. It's uh, had, it had a bit of a move down on Friday. Uh, it's, it's hovering above this 140 area of support, quite a big, quite a big area of support now, down at 140. Uh, we've got earnings next Friday. So they're obviously the, the first big bank to report, or they're, they're usually one of the first. Um, so I just think that the odds are this week they don't the stock doesn't make new lows this week, right? If it's going to make new lows, probably going to be post earnings, um, and therefore selling a bit of downside, kind of underwriting the stock for this Friday looks okay here, right? Because realized vol's been quite low in the mid teens, implied vol's still in the twenties, so you're getting a bit of juice by selling those puts. The so stock's trading. You know, we're stock trading like 143 ish. Yep. Um, and you could sell the 141 puts, uh, nick a little bit of premium out of them between now and Friday. Right. So that would be my kind of YOLO trade. Right. The YOLO you trade you know, for this. This is a pre earnings put that you're selling, not post -earnings. pre earnings. Yeah. So the earnings date is the 13th, which is next yep. Friday, but I'd sell the 6th, which is this Friday, because I'm basically right. saying that the stock doesn't need to do anything much this week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it already got whacked on Friday as well, it, like 2%. And critical on that, that positioning before earnings is that the vol is probably going to hold up for any expiration past equal to or past that earnings date, right? And so that is exactly. a critical distinction. So, yeah, so because so, uh, if you sold the if you sold a put expiring on next Friday or the or a date after that, the risk that you're taking is you're not going to earn any time decay between now right. and then because the market is going to imply a three percent move on earnings, whatever. And, and often what happens with earning moves is as you get close to the event, the implied earnings move actually gets bigger because people right. get more and more interested and more and more excited about the event. So what happens is that the time decay of the option doesn't ever manifest as any time decay and the option doesn't drop in premium the way it should do. So you're always taking a bit of a risk by selling options that contain a big jump event like an earnings because they just don't decay well, right? Um, sometimes when the vault crazy high on them and they're already implied move is already massive, like NVIDIA, for example, last earnings, the implied move got to, you know, 10% or whatever it was. <laughs> then, then, okay, it will still decay. But I think for a stock like JP, where the implied move is 3% and it actually sometimes does bigger than that on earnings, I don't see a lot of value in selling an option that contains the, the actual earnings move. Right. So this is the term structure for JP Morgan. Here is the, the six, which is the option that you're looking at. And you can see this big spike in implied. Uh, due to that earnings uh, release. So there's the kind of the visual representation of what you were just discussing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, turning now, second one is Amazon. This is the name that I sort of <laughs> flagged uh, in, in my data as well. So what's your what's your look on Amazon? I know you, you preface this whole thing by saying there's not any like super juicy setups, but what do you kind of see in Amazon that's interesting to you? So yeah, I mean, you can see that it's carved out, you know, a correction quite a meaningful one back down to this 120 mm. 127 area i believe right um there's quite a lot of volume that volume shelf there is so there's quite a lot of volume support there as well uh it's at the lower bollinger band so these are all reasons why you know tactically you, you would get a bit more bullish um now i'm looking in general for the nasdaq to rally into year end i think these mega cap tech names are going to be the names that people want to own again mm -hmm. when when the market finally does kick back into gear um i put out something in my daily note this week saying that 
or today, not this week, but um, saying that the valuations, when you adjust the valuations for, for earnings growth, so you look at the peg ratio, they look quite cheap in mega cap tech names look quite cheap relative to the median S&P name, right? Mm. So if that's the sort of thing that's going to drive people into those names for a, for a year end performance chase, then yeah, Amazon's going to participate basically, right? So, so I think owning December calls in Amazon, I, I'd go to December just because the curve is inverted. So the front end vols are higher. The one month vols contain earnings at the end of the October. So push yourself out a bit to like three months. So not only do you get a bit of a vol discount by going out to three months, you also get um, much more time for the view to actually play out, right? So I, you know, I think I, I'm not going to buy the earnings volatility, but only December calls in general. Any single stock calls that I'm buying for a year end rally, I'm, I'm generally parking them in December right now, which is why what I did with Google last week with that suggestion and and the same suggestion for Amazon. I think December calls are probably the way for. Um, I, I like that idea too, and and we had picked up uh, Amazon on on some of our uh, new scanners that we're working on because I like this 125 uh, level. Which we, you know, you had just kind of mentioned that that's right in here. This is where our put wall is. The name, as you mentioned before, has really been dragged lower. I think that this has boosted the uh, implied volatility of the name a little bit. And really, what the what the key here is that I too think a rally is setting up. And so, if you want to play upside, you know, you you got to stick with the big seven in this scenario, the higher for longer scenario. If we do rally, these are the names that are going to do better. And I would argue too that if the market is weak, these names should probably hold up better as well right so so maybe there's a little bit less relative pain depending on how you want to express your uh your upside idea um, so I've... Another, another way of expressing that view for those who don't want to be completely one leg simple trades yeah please far away is, is you could own the december calls in amazon and you could sell some october or end of october whatever captures the earnings date Whatever captures the earnings premium. Yeah, that'd be the 11.3 is the earnings okay so yeah so they sell some calls on that date and because they're going to trade quite expensive, basically, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you actually have a call calendar on and you make sure the net delta of the position is still positive because you're bullish mm -hmm. in stock, but that can actually save you a reasonable amount of money in terms of the premium that you're spending. Uh, that might be a smart way to, to play, play an, a, a move up, but, but, but take advantage of the shape of the surface. Yeah. yeah I, I like that. Uh, I like that idea a lot, reducing that net cost. I actually think if you do think there will be a rally into October OPEX, which is turning out to be a decent size expiration, uh, I do think some of these October expiration calls, if you could find them cheap uh, or if you can uh, put on some kind of a call fly to help reduce your costs, that kind of thing uh, could be interesting. Or even selling something like NASDAQ or Spider calls as a way to fund uh, these Amazon calls, because I think that uh, that in an upside scenario, Amazon will really outperform. So uh, that may give you... Um, a bit of extra juice. And I, I think Amazon could rally pretty sharply uh, with 140 as kind of like my top level. So if we do pop, I, I do think we could get a pretty meaningful move up into this 135 to 140 area uh, based on how all the positions here are, are, are laid out. So you can see that there's a lot of call positions. Um, again, kind of this 140 call wall is, is really that upside level that we're, uh, we're watching to that October OPEX. So again, a lot is predicated on the fact that we could get uh, get a rally in the macro market sort of sentiment and move here. And I think that's, you know, there's a little bit of sort of path dependency between you and me, I think, on when that uh, rally could happen here. But I do think that this is a great time. This is why you like to own calls, right? To give you that upside optionality. Yep. All right. So that in round, we're going to wrap this one up as we keep these Monday morning meetings about 15 minutes. Yep. Um, if good. people want to reach out to you, what is the best way to do that so they can make sure that they're getting your juiciest calls um so okay options underscore insight is my twitter handle so we obviously put loads of stuff on there uh, throughout the week um but if you want to talk to us directly and look into our actual products and our services uh options hyphen insight.com uh come and check us out there we do offer a free month to everything we do um so you can really kick the tires and get a sense for whether we can help your process and help you make money that's the goal awesome I'm at SpotGam on Twitter. You can reach us at SpotGam.com. Also, there's a little QR code in the top left there. That's The Hedge featuring Im Imran. It's our Options Academy. It takes you all the way through what's a call and put all the way up into uh, Delta Hedging like a pro, right? Um, so uh, with that, Imran, we will end it up, and we'll see you uh, next week. See you next week, bud. Bye.